Insider buying is surging, and legendary investors are piling into one specific gold deal, where the founders have already earned investors 500 and 900% gains on their two previous companies in the past 11 years. Insiders own 40% of the company. This is the gold play you don't want to miss out on. Learn more at futuremoneytrends.com slash insider. Greetings and thank you for joining us at futuremoneytrends.com. I have one of the most popular guests we've had on in the past year. Uh, he put out a red alert warning just right before things started to really come apart in the markets. And here we are today. Uh, the markets are more volatile than ever these last few months here. Gold and silver are starting to make a big climb. Uh, the mining shares are going ballistic uh, in a good way this time. And our guest today is Michael Snyder of the economic collapse blog.com. If you've ever been to zerohedge.com, and, and I think some of his articles may have even been linked from Drudge to Zero Hedge, uh, he is uh, he has some of the most brilliant articles out there. It's all it's researched really well. Um, and then he put some of the best lists together, uh, 20 reasons why unemployment numbers are not, you know, what they seem and and so on. And I just really enjoy his website when I'm trying to kind of search for ideas of what to research in economic data and what rabbit hole I can go down. I'll often go to the economic collapse blog dot com and he's got like, you know, a thousand ideas and then, you know, and plenty of research to back it up to kind of uh, send me on my way down to my own rabbit hole. So, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be back with you. Thank you for having me on the show today. Well, I'm really glad we got a chance to talk to you uh, right now because the the world really seems to kind of be tearing apart at the seams you know here in the u.s we're seeing a major insurgent uh in, insurgency in the in the candidates uh, a rejection of the establishment uh we're also seeing the propaganda at levels that really are just absurd with the 4.9 percent unemployment rate and the Dow Jones still, you know, over 16,000 when it really has no business being at those valuations, considering what's happening around the world. Uh, and gold, again, is at 1,200, which is higher than it's been, but still absurdly low for what's going on. So let's start off with 2016. Is this an inflection point in the economy? And please give us an update in that answer on your warning that you really, you had never done before, that you were very concerned that the wheels were going to start to come off. Yeah, in the middle of last year, I issued this warning, really unprecedented for me, but, you know, everything was telling me that the financial markets, we are heading into another time of crisis. And so uh, then uh, just a couple months later in August, the shaking began and we started to see uh, volatility in the financial markets that we had not seen since the last financial crisis but then that initial kind of was shaking came and then there was some stabilization and people said oh it wasn't that bad it wasn't that big of a crisis but what they didn't realize is that it was just kind of the initial tremors and then of course things continued to get worse and 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 you know we had a, a bit of a bouncing back here in the u.s not to where we were before but in some parts of the world you know whether it's russia you know, whether it's uh, Canada, you know, uh, Brazil, a lot of these markets just kept sliding throughout the rest of the year. And then we kind of got to uh, January, the turn of the year, and as someone like uh, uh, pressed the accelerator in terms of the financial markets again, we really had the worst start to a year that we had ever seen, not just in the, in the United States, but all over the world globally. And just a couple weeks here ago, we saw a headline for the first time since the last financial crisis, global stocks enter a bear market. And uh, most of your listeners are already uh, familiar with what that is, but it means basically global stocks as a whole were down about 20% at that point, which means that you know, uh, uh, one fifth, approximately one fifth of all global stock market wealth had already been wiped out. We only had four fifths left at that point. And so, and, and, and just, uh, I think it was last week, that, that at one point, um, uh, or maybe it was the week before, all, all of them are starting to blend together for me. But at one point here, just recently, a, a total of $16.5 trillion had been wiped out from stock market markets around the world. That doesn't even count bonds and other things. 
So we had seen just this massive amount of wealth wiped out globally, almost as much as, as you know, getting up to the level of the U.S. national debt. Now, of course, the past few days, we've seen a bouncing back, and, and markets never go down just in a straight line. Even if you remember back in the, 2000, the crisis of 2008, actually, the two best days uh, in terms of a point increase in, in U.S. stock market history were right in the middle of the crash of 2008. So when, you know, just because stocks go up on a day or two does not mean that the crisis is over. But we've seen this huge downturn in the financial markets, really unlike anything we've seen since the crisis of 2008 and 2009. Now, in my perspective, in my opinion, we're still in the early chapters because junk bonds and, and everything else uh, all, you know, all of the red flags are still screaming that a lot more is to come. Meanwhile, kind of the entire global economy in terms of the real economy is kind of imploding. And in, in particular, I'm talking about um, global trade and, and, and what we're seeing there. We're just seeing some absolutely crazy things happen, happen there. The Baltic Dry Index just recently uh, uh, dropped below uh, um 300 i didn't even know that it could go that low hmm. you know that which is absolutely crazy and bloomberg just recently reported and th and and you're going like this daniel bloomberg recently reported that it's now because global trade has imploded so much it's now cheaper to rent a 1100 foot merchant vessel than it is to rent a ferrari which is wow. just insane now the fuel costs and everything else are, uh, are, are uh, you know, may, once you add in the fuel costs, it's more expensive to rent the merchant vessel, but just the rental fee itself is more expensive to rent a Ferrari than, you know, one of those big ships that goes across the ocean. So this is getting uh, really, really crazy. It's incredible. And, you know, and there really is uh, something going on in the underlying economy when you see that the commodities themselves are just crashing. And it's just been devastating. I mean, even the master commodity, oil. But clearly, gold and silver have decoupled themselves from the rest of this group here. Uh, when you look at um, the, the world economy as a whole and this negative interest rate environment, this war on cash, is gold going to be a safe haven um, in the end, when we, we may be going cashless. And if we go cashless, really, you cannot even trade your gold and sell your gold at a later time uh, unless you're willing to do something that's going to be stamped digitally uh, with the central planners. And I know people could trade gold for another, another asset, but realistically, if somebody wants to take some profit on gold in a cashless society, they can't. So what do you, what do you think gold's role is in a cashless society? Well, I, I don't think we're there quite yet. And, and the U.S. is probably going to be slower than much of the rest of the world for, for a number of reasons. But we are seeing this huge move toward a cashless society. You know, in Denmark, they have a stated goal of going cashless, of, uh, quote, eradicating cash, unquote, by the year 2030. In Norway, the biggest bank in Norway recently came out, and, and many of their branches aren't even dealing in cash anymore. But they came out and they and they recently and said, you know what, we should just ban cash from all of society. You know, and they're proposing to the government, hey, let's just get rid of cash. In Sweden, almost everything is done cashless now. Very much a cashless society. They even give the homeless people on the street electronic readers so that when they sell their magazines or whatever to make some money, they can accept payment. Uh, electronically so and if you go to church in Sweden you know you almost everyone gives their money through the uh, through the little uh, the scanners um, and so in, in Sweden they've, they, they've literally taken out thousands of ATM machines many bank branches will neither take cash nor give out cash anymore and 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 so Sweden is and you know a lot of these northern European countries especially are very much embracing this but when it's not just in europe over in india there's actually the government's making the push they're encouraging people to start using debit cards to quit using so much cash so even in a poor country like india there's a push in that direction 
And of course, you know, Germany recently made headlines when there was a proposal there to ban certain cash transactions over a certain amount. But this has already happened in Spain and France and Italy. You can you can uh, do a cash transaction up to a certain amount, whether it's 1,000 euros, 2,500 euros. The, the limits are different in different countries. But if you go over that, over the limit, that it's an illegal transaction. It's against the law. And so those are steps in the direction of going cashless by, you know, by taking that limit down, down, down. It's a move in that direction. Now, banks really like the idea of a cashless system because what? We all have to use the banks. We all have to be have our money in the banks. So there's no pulling money out of the bank, sticking it in your mattress in, in that type of situation. And then, of course, banks, when we swipe our card or we you know, use our credit cards or whatever, uh, you know, they can collect fees on, on all these transactions. So the banks really like it. Now, governments really like the idea of a cashless system because it enables them to watch and track and monitor, you know, basically everything we're doing, you know, because we, you know, everything we do in our lives, we're spending money. And so then the governments can watch all that, make sure taxes are being collected, this and that, the other thing. But my real concern is that this sets up the kind of scenario where all of a sudden then the government can become the gatekeeper and they can say, okay, if you want to use the system, then we can put some conditions on you for using the system. You've got to comply with what we're demanding of you or else you can't have a bank account, you can't get a job, you can't buy, you can't sell, you can't participate in this electronic digital system. So I'm very concerned about that. Now in terms of gold and silver, here in the United States at least, I think it's a while before we get fully get to a cashless system. So I think at least in the in the midterm, I believe that it is a great way to protect your wealth, particularly during a time of financial crisis. I think investors are starting to realize what's happening. So they're starting to move into gold and silver. And as you said, gold is very, very undervalued, and we're likely to see it move up dramatically. Now, my wife and I, we have a particular affinity for silver, because as, as far as gold being undervalued, we think silver is just massively undervalued. You know, it was sitting at 14-something now. I think it's up around 15-something. But if you look at the ratio of gold and silver, historically, you know, people say it comes out of the ground at, what, 9 to 1, 10 to 1, 12 to 1. Yep. Different people use different numbers. But in terms of the, you look at the price ratio today, I mean, it's far, far higher than that, the ratio. So we think at some point that, you know, both gold and silver are going to go up, but the ratio between the two is going to correct. And so we actually believe the percentage returns for silver are actually going to be better than gold in our humble opinion. So we have absolutely love silver for, for kind of a, a, a midterm time frame. Yeah, I totally agree. Silver, uh, especially 81, but, you know, with the silver being so unique in the sense that it's consumed uh, a lot more than gold. And uh, the, there is, uh, you know, two thirds of the silver comes from base metal mines and those mines are shutting down because of the depression we're talking about. Well, Michael, uh, oil. Oil is such an important commodity uh, for Saudi Arabia, Russia, the U.S., and of course, the whole world. But, you know, when you look at uh, the U.S. and you, no one knows this data more than you. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it's specifically since 2009, any of the actual good jobs that have been created are probably either uh, oil or a derivative of oil jobs. And that have, has boosted many economies, specifically Texas, Wyoming and Oklahoma. But I guess my ultimate question is, is with oil prices at $30 unprofitable for many U.S. producers, um, not good for the Russian economy, uh, not good for Saudi Arabia's, is this all leading to war, specifically in the Middle East? Because that is what will give oil, the oil price the biggest kick for the people and the countries, very powerful countries, that really now at this point need oil to rise. Because if oil doesn't rise, U.S. economy probably just going to spiral down. Uh, Russia is in is in great danger. Uh, the same situation. So at this point, there's there's it's not just the hedge funds and maybe speculators that want oil to rise, but you've got some of the biggest militaries on earth that want oil to go up. That's a really good point because you know the, the some of the biggest oil producers in the world, Russia, Saudi Arabia, they're right in the middle of this thing in in Syria. So, yeah, you know, you look at Russian stocks, they've already gone down by over half. You know, Saudi in Saudi Arabia, their market 
is down over 40 percent, almost half. So, you know, these these countries, uh, the, the big oil producers have just been decimated. Brazil is another one that just decimated by by this downturn where they, you know, in, here in the United States, you know, we're, you know, bouncing around, you know, you know, are we in a correction or not, you know, 10 percent. But these other countries, they've already had a full blown stock market collapse, you know. Um, and so, they, you know, Russia would be extremely happy if the price of oil went back up dramatically. So would Saudi Arabia. And so and of course, a major war in the Middle East would do that as soon as, you know, uh, a, a, a ground invasion of Syria happened, the price of oil would just start shooting back through the roof. And I believe it will happen at some point. Now, you know, a lot of Americans are not paying attention to what's happening in Syria, but they need to, because, because right now in Turkey, they've got, you know, uh, thousands upon thousands of troops. They've got military ve vehicles massed along the border. They've been shelling positions in northern Syria, Kurdish positions, and some international news reports say Syrian military positions have been also been hit by the artillery. And then, of course, there was that bombing in Ankara, which the Turks then blamed on the Kurds, even though the Syrian Kurds said we didn't have anything to do with it, but the but Turkey said uh, we don't care, and so they sent they sent in a military aircraft to bombard Kurdish positions in northern Syria, and some reports say also northern Iraq, um, and so there's already shooting happening on the northern side of the border. Meanwhile, uh, down south. Um, in Saudi Arabia, they've in northern Saudi Arabia right now, they've organized what they are calling the largest military exercise in the history of the Middle East, where they claim they're bringing together hundreds of thousands of soldiers, thousands of military vehicles, hundreds of military aircraft to conduct military exercises, which are kind of thrown together at the last minute from 20 different nations all gathering together. Now, sometimes a military exercise is just a military exercise, and sometimes a military exercise is actually cover for uh, the preparations for an invasion. Now, of course, if Saudi Arabia wanted to invade, they would kind of probably either have to go through Western Iraq, which Iraq is saying, no, go, we're not going to allow you to do that, or go through Jordan. And right now, Jordan is Jordan's saying, yeah, we're willing to go along with a, a ground operation, but we want the United States and the British to lead the way, and we want to coordinate with the Russians, with the, which the Russians are not going to do. So that force in northern Saudi Arabia, I mean, it's kind of unclear what you know if there's really a path forward for them or if they're just rattling the saber or whatever. But tensions are really high in there because basically what has happened – is that you go back to 2011 and, went, and at the time the whole Arab Spring thing was going on and so Saudi Arabia and Turkey the major Sunni powers you know they got together with US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and they say hey look you know all these other dictators are being overthrown why don't we use this as an opportunity to overthrow Assad in Syria and why they want to do that is because you know uh, Syria is you know 74 percent of the people who live there are Sunni Muslim but then, uh, you know, Assad, he's, he's not Sunni, he's a Alawi, and, which is, a, you know, kind of a form of, of Shia Islam. And, of course, Syria is, is great friends with allies with Iran, and so they're part of that kind of uh, Shia crescent that runs, from, you know, from Iran then through you know, Syria and into Lebanon. And so, the, you know, Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Hillary Clinton, they said, well, you know what, we can, we can uh, go in, we can break Iran's power in the region, we can overthrow Assad, we'll get, you know, Sunni leaders elected, it'll become a full-fledged Sunni nation, wouldn't this be great? You yeah. know, completely shift things in the Middle East. And, uh, and so they thought it was just a grand idea. So they started organizing protests, and the, then they started arming, and, and, and a conflict erupted. A, so a civil war has been going on for five years. And most Americans don't realize this, but uh, Saudi Arabia and, and Qatar and the United Arab Emirates and Turkey and, and others have been just pouring millions and millions and millions of dollars into these Sunni militant groups, arming them. Um, including groups that are, uh, uh, you know, al allied or offshoots of Al Qaeda, and including ISIS. Um, and uh, you know, I've written about how ISIS fighters, when they get 
wounded, they actually go across the border into Turkey where they're treated at Turkish hospitals and then they're sent back across the border. And, uh, and, and actually, uh, and the whole thing with the ISIS oil trade where ISIS has been shipping uh, 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 hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, what some estimates say $800 million of oil has been shipped into Turkey where, where then it is uh, uh, you know, sold to the rest of the world from Turkey. And, uh, and, and the Russians have produced photographic and satellite evidence of this showing this endless stream of trucks going into uh, oil trucks going into Turkey. And now, of course, the Russians have come along and, and, and they've started bombing all that and kind of shut that down. So Turkey got extremely upset about that. But basically, at first, um, you know, these Sunni militant groups, including ISIS, they were winning. They were taking ground. They were taking taking cities, Aleppo fell, the, which was the largest city in Turkey, the center of their economy. So at first it looked like Assad was going to lose, it was going to work. These Sunni groups were going to take out Assad and, and, and everything was going according to plan. But then Assad said, hey, you know, they, he called on the Russians to come help him. He called on uh, um, uh, Iran and Hezbollah and they've come in and, and they're helping him. Um, and so that completely turned the tide of the war. And so now the Sunni groups are losing and, uh, and they're being routed and they're being driven back. And in fact, uh, you know, the, the, the Syrian government and the Kurds, uh, you know, in the north who are kind of doing their own thing, but they're making so much progress against these militant groups that basically the supply lines are in danger of being cut off from, you know, it's Turkey supplying the fighters and uh, and the Sunnis militant groups are going to lose. And so Saudi Arabia and Turkey are sitting there and saying, hey, if the war ends now, all of a sudden Russia has a major presence there. I Iran has, um, is much closer to Syria and has much more of a presence and, and, and influence in Syria than ever before. Hezbollah all of a sudden becomes a major player in Syria and would probably become quite dominant in the country in the years ahead. And so the Turkey and Saudi Arabia are saying, if the war ends now, we're gonna, things are gonna be much worse than if we never even attempted to overthrow Assad. <laughs> and so, so Syria and Turkey, I'm mean, sorry, Turkey and Saudi Arabia at this point are saying, okay, either we have to completely give up and, and this is a total disaster for us, or we've got to go in ourselves and try to overthrow Assad and, and so with all this saber rattling and, and massing of troops, it looks like that's what they want to do. In fact, you know, the Saudi foreign minister just came out and said, Assad is going to be overthrown either by a political process or it's going to be done by force. And so they're still talking very much like they're, they're determined to do this. Now, of course, they want the United States to lead the way. They're very much trying to convince the Obama administration to get involved. But if we go in, and if they go in Saudi Arabia and Turkey and start heading toward Damascus, they ri risk a full-fledged war conflict with Hezbollah, with Iran, but and, and even most importantly, the Russians potentially setting off World War III right there in the Middle East, which would cause the price of oil to absolutely skyrocket, but in the process would also probably crash financial markets all over the planet. You know, I would say that last statement right there is the biggest wild card of 2016 because there are a lot of things going on and, and people can read all about that on uh, the economic collapse blog dot com. But right there, if there is a war, if those if those uh, militaries uh, start making their march towards Damascus, Russia is going to get involved. It will drag the U.S. in. in. Um, you know, we haven't even mentioned Israel because just like Saddam Hussein, you know, as a distraction, uh, lob, lob scud missiles at Israel. So who knows what would happen if, uh, you know, what Syria's response would be or Iran's response and, you know, how Israel would have to respond to any kind of, uh, you know, thing that Syria would do to uh, unify, um, you know, other Muslim countries um, on their side if they were, uh, you know, to lob something over Israel's way. Um, for this uh, scenario, um, what's the timeline? You think this is playing out right now as we speak in real time, or you think this is something we should be watchful throughout the year, or does it really potentially heat up towards the end of the year? 
Well, I think right now is a critical time because you've got all these troops which have gathered from 20 nations right there in northern Saudi Arabia. And so they're, you know, scheduled to go for basically, you know, 18 days, about three weeks, these exercises. But eventually, at some point, if nothing happens, presumably those those forces will start to go home. So I think we're in a really critical time right now. Um, and of course, shooting is already happening, you know, uh, up there in Turkey, you know, across the border. But why also this is such a critical time is because, you know, the Syrian forces, along with Iran and Hezbollah, backed by the Russian Air Force, they're making steady gains. And, and they're, in, you know, like I said, they're in danger of completely cutting off the supply lines to Turkey, recapturing Aleppo. Basically, you know, the war could almost be over here in a few weeks or a few months, potentially, in which case then if the war is over, then, you know, what are Turkey and Saudi Arabia going to do then? Um, so the, the the time for them, to, if they're going to intervene, it's kind of right now, you know, or within the next few weeks. So I think we are in that danger zone. Turkey and Saudi Arabia are feeling a tremendous amount of, of pressure. So I think that this is something to watch. Hopefully cooler heads will prevail um, because... You know, if, 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 if the fur really starts flying there in Syria between these two sides, uh, the Russians have already, according to uh, former Associated Press reporter Robert Perry, the Russians have already warned Turkey that they're willing to use tactical nukes to keep forces away from Damascus. So the Russians have nukes. Saudi Arabia has nukes. Most people don't realize this, but they have the bomb. Uh, and many people believe, and I happen to believe, that Iran actually already has nuclear weapons. So we're talking about a, a situation where we could potentially see nuclear war in the Middle East, at least to a limited degree. And of course, what would that do to the global economy and the global financial system? This is a huge wild card. And, uh, and I think, you know, if you're in the financial world, you know, this could become the biggest story of 2016 so far by far. So it's something to very, very much keep an eye on. Almost seems like a big out for the central banks and the Keynesian economists too. If this thing whole, this thing blew up and they could put all the blame on the Middle East. Uh, Michael Snyder of the economic collapse blog.com. Everyone go to that website, bookmark it. It's a must, it's a must uh, read website uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, I know Zero Hedge picks it up often. And if you if you read some of these articles, I mean, essentially, um, you can have an economics degree in less than a year just from reading all of his articles. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Continued to get worse, and 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 you know, we had a, a bit of a bouncing back. Here in the U.S., not to where we were before, but in some parts of the world, you know, whether it's Russia, you know, whether it's uh, Canada, you know, uh, Brazil, a lot of these markets just kept sliding throughout the rest of the year. And then we kind of got to uh, January, the turn of the year, and as someone like uh, uh, pressed the accelerator in terms of the financial markets again, we really had the worst start to a year that we had ever seen, not just in the, uni in the United States, but all over the world globally. And just a couple weeks here ago, we saw a headline for the first time since the last financial crisis, global stocks enter a bear market. And uh, most of your listeners are already uh, familiar with what that is, but it means basically global stocks as a whole were down about 20% at that point, which means that you know uh, about one fifth, approximately one fifth of all global stock market wealth had already been wiped out. We only had four fifths left at that point. And so, and, and, and just, uh, I think it was last week that, that at one point, um, uh, or maybe it was the week before, all, all of them are starting to blend together for me. But at one point here, just recently, a, a total of $16.5 trillion had been wiped out from stock mar markets around the world. That doesn't even count bonds and other things. So we had seen just this massive amount of wealth wiped out globally, almost as much as, as you know, getting up to the level of the U.S. national debt. Now, of course, the past few days, we've seen a bouncing back, and, and markets never go down just in a straight line, even if you remember back in the 2000, the crisis. this is getting uh, really, really crazy. 
It's incredible. And, you know, and there really is uh, something going on in the underlying economy when you see that the commodities themselves are just crashing and it's just been devastating. I mean, even the master commodity oil, but clearly gold and silver have decoupled themselves from the rest of this group here. Uh, when you look at um, the the world economy as a whole and this negative interest rate environment, this war on cash, is gold going to be a safe haven um, in the end when we, we may be going cashless? And if we go cashless, really you cannot even trade your gold and sell your gold at a later time uh, unless you're willing to do something that's going to be stamped digitally uh, with the central planners. And I know people could trade gold for another another asset, but realistically, if somebody wants to take some profit on gold in a cashless society, they can't. So what do you, what do you think gold's role is in a cashless society? Well, I, I don't think we're there quite yet. And, and the U.S. is probably going to be slower than much of the rest of the world for, for a number of reasons. But we are seeing this huge move toward a cashless society. You know, in Denmark, they have a stated goal of going cashless, of, uh, quote, eradicating cash, unquote, by the year 2030. In Norway, the biggest bank in Norway recently came out, and in many of their branches aren't even dealing in cash anymore. But they came out and they and they recently and said, you know what, we should just ban cash from all of society. You know, and they're proposing to the. Insider buying is surging, and legendary investors are piling into one specific gold deal, where the founders have already earned investors 500 and 900% gains on their two previous companies in the past 11 years. Insiders own 40% of the company. This is the gold play you don't want to miss out on. Learn more at futuremoneytrends.com slash insider. Greetings and thank you for joining us at futuremoneytrends.com. I have one of the most popular guests we've had on in the past year. Uh, he put out a red alert warning just right before things started to really come apart in the markets. And here we are today. Uh, the markets are more volatile than ever these last few months here. Gold and silver are starting to make a big climb. Uh, the mining shares are going ballistic uh, in a good way this time. And our guest today is Michael Snyder of the economic collapse blog.com. If you've ever been to zerohedge.com, and, and I think some of his articles may have even been linked from Drudge to Zero Hedge, uh, he is uh, he has some of the most brilliant articles out there. It's all it's researched really well. Um, and then he puts some of the best lists together. Uh, 20 reasons why unemployment numbers are not, you know, what they seem and and so on. And I just really enjoy his website when I'm trying to kind of search for ideas of what to research in economic data and what rabbit hole I can go down. I'll often go to the economic collapse blog .com and he's got like, you know, a thousand ideas and then, you know, and plenty of research to back it up to kind of a uh, this is a 2008. Actually, the two best days uh, in terms of a point increase in, in U.S. stock market history were right in the middle of the crash of 2008. So when, you know, just because stocks go up on a day or two does not mean that the crisis is over. But we've seen this huge downturn in the financial markets, really unlike anything we've seen since the crisis of 2008 and 2009. Now, in my perspective, in my opinion, we're still in the early chapters because junk bonds and, and everything else, uh, all, you know, all of the red flags are still screaming that a lot more is to come. Meanwhile, kind of the entire global economy in terms of the real economy is kind of imploding. And in, in particular, I'm talking about um, global trade and, and, and what we're seeing there. We're just seeing some absolutely crazy things happen, happen there. The Baltic Dry Index just recently uh, uh, dropped below uh, um, 300. I didn't even know that it could go that low, you know, that which is absolutely crazy. And Bloomberg just recently reported, and, and, and you're going like this, Daniel, Bloomberg recently reported that it's now, because global trade has imploded so much, it's now cheaper to rent a 1,100 foot merchant vessel than it is to rent a Ferrari. 
which is wow. just insane. Now the fuel costs and everything else are uh, are are uh, you know may, once you add in the fuel costs, it's more expensive to rent the merchant vessel. But just the rental fee itself is more expensive to rent a Ferrari than you know one of those big ships that goes across the ocean. So send me on my way down to my own rabbit hole. So Michael, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be back with you. Thank you for having me on the show today. Well, I'm really glad we got a chance to talk to you uh, right now because the the world really seems to kind of be tearing apart at the seams. You know, here in the U.S., we're seeing a major insurgent uh, in, insurgency in the in the candidates, uh, a rejection of the establishment. Uh, we're also seeing the propaganda at levels that really are just absurd with the 4.9% unemployment rate and the Dow Jones still, you know, over 16,000 when it really has no business being at those valuations considering what's happening around the world. Uh, and gold again is at 1200, which is higher than it's been, but still absurdly low for what's going on. So let's start off with 2016. Is this an inflection point in the economy? And please give us an update in that answer on your warning that you really you had never done before, that you were very concerned that the wheels were going to start to come off. Yeah, in the middle of last year, I issued this warning, really unprecedented for me, but, you know, everything was telling me that the financial markets, we are heading into another time of crisis. And so uh, then uh, just a couple months later in August, the shaking began and we started to see uh, volatility in the financial markets that we had not seen since the last financial crisis but then that initial kind of was shaking came and then there was some stabilization and people said oh it wasn't that bad it wasn't that big of a crisis but what they didn't realize is that it was just kind of the initial tremors and then of course things continue